put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Assassin's Creed 3, video game review. Our merry band of assassins have yet again arrived at the place where they're supposed to activate something or find something that leads them to the next place in this big treasure hunt. This is, of course, promised to be the ultimate one. We get a bit of an exposition dump summing up what's happened in the story so far, which is probably pretty smart, but it's like the fifth game, I think. And right after that, the shock of all this information about what's actually going on sends Desmond into a coma, and thus we enter Animus mode. Lucky for him, though, it is one of those 24-minute comas that have been going around because pretty soon he is moving about comfortably outside of the Animus. He recovered off-screen. Well, I guess, you know, after recovering easily from comas several times, you get a bit of a knack for it. And he... his persona, the, the assassin that he takes on of his past, is Connor, a part Native American, part Englishman, who fights the Assassin Templar fight. To be fair, he does have a little more motivation. He is basically protecting his village of Native Americans. And, you know, the whole Assassin Templar thing is just, well, it appears to be the Templars who are threatening them, so... And along the way, you help Pocahontas as portrayed by Mila Jovovich. To be fair, she's actually a really cool character. There's this bit where she enters a bar and she's like the only Native American there and there's this drunken soldier who's like stumbling towards her. Clearly he's gonna make a pass at her and she just, you know, does this and that's it. He's shot down, you know. It's just, well, come on, it's like the 1700s. Talk to the Hand hadn't gotten old yet. And her voice actress is actually Native American and that's a really strong suit of this. The, they get a lot of Native American voice actors and actual dialogue in there. It's, of course, subbed into English or whatever language you choose. And I suppose that pretty well sums up the plot. I guess I should briefly give a, an idea of what this game is like. It's pretty much business as usual. If you are a long-time fan of the franchise, yeah, it's probably gonna be at least fine for you. Maybe slightly below what you've come to expect of the series. I'll get into more detail. If you already feel that the basic elements of the series have gotten stale, then stay away from this one. It's only getting worse. It's only gotten worse in this one, I should say. And if you're new to the series, do not start with this one. If you want to get into it, maybe start with the second one and build your way up to it. If you start with this one, you're going to have no clue what's going on. The exposition dump does not do enough. And worse, you're going to have no clue how to do what you're meant to do, because this i played the other games, you know, the, the major ones, not like, I think there are minor ones, like for whatever. I've played, you know, one, two Brotherhood and Revelations. 
There are so many new things in this, and it barely explains them. I never really got good at, like, crafting at the homestead, and also seems like no matter how far ahead you get, there's still stuff you're missing, or craftsmen you're missing, I, I don't know. Anyway, to get into more detail, I should start with some of the positives, because this definitely does have positives. It just also has negatives that, you know, once you weigh them out, it kind of comes out to just being average for a game and for the franchise. Basically, the graphics really are great. They're not, they're not like amazing or excellent. I mentioned in my Hitman Absolution review that I had not yet played, at the time I had not yet played Assassin's Creed 3. This game has nothing on the graphics of Absolution, I'm sorry. Nothing. Anyway, they are great. Outside of the occasional Samekian dead eyes and carpets that I can only imagine have been beaten with carpet beaters made from wood from the ugly tree. And in fact, to further make my case that the ugly tree is present in this game, quite a few of the trees that you find are the ugly tree. Yeah, and, but, but yes, what, what it amounts to, they, they've also got a lot of great weather systems, you know, what, physics of weather. Snow is probably the most prominent, like if you, when you're walking around the frontier, you can feel when you're getting into deeper snow. And I'm not just talking about that, your character will move slow, we've seen that before, no your feet and legs will start to sink down and the animation will change like he's really struggling to just make sure he doesn't fall over like like when you're walking in deep snow and they do great on that so the atmosphere is really effective and the the weather actually changes over the course of it and not only in single player actually in multiplayer as well sometimes and it feels very natural, it feels very alive, which is something that the series has done a fairly decent job of making this open world actually feel alive. But yes, yeah, you've got snow, you've got fog, rain, complete with you know thunder, did not see any actual lightning light, only flashes off in the distance, but you know. That's also, you don't really want to get too much into that, that's a bit cliche, lightning close to characters, that's, you know. This one is very much going for the realism, more so than the others, and this does have some negative effects as well. For example, hiding spots and where you can climb, the acrobatics, are tougher to see because they're not really, you know, before the stuff that you could climb on would stick out, so you could basically tell, ah, I can climb there. And hiding spots would have this animus kind of effect. And most of that is kind of gone here. And I would say that you basically do get used to the hiding spots because it, you've still got the bench where the middle spot is, you know, three person benches with the middle, you know, remaining open. And now you can actually hide between any two, you can blend between any two people, you know, no matter where you are. It isn't specific anymore. And they've done some more detailed animations for that. Again, in multiplayer as well. In multiplayer, if you're standing in like a tavern and you're standing, you're blending with a static crowd, your character will materialize a, you know, a mug and he'll stop standing there like, you know, so that's pretty cool. The, the free running, however, really does suffer from it. There is they, they continue to not address the issue that you don't really know what your character is going to do from you pressing a directional button or, you know, pressing the jump key. Well, more so the directional button. Sometimes, you, you know, the jump key, you more or less know what's going to happen, especially if you're hanging on something, if you aren't standing, you know, with your feet on a solid surface. And 
this botches the stuff, leading to a lot of frustration more often than not, frankly, and really the, the stealth, the biggest issue with it is that you don't know exactly how to get where you're going because you can't tell where you can climb and you don't know what your character's going to do when you're trying to climb. And various just glitches and bugs that suddenly have you going in or out of a stealth area and the like and yeah, really. And again, this is not why, this is not what should be challenging about stealth. It should not be that you're fighting the controls and the actual interface more so than just trying to, to sneak. Look, look at how, you know, Hitman did stealth before Absolution. Look at how Splinter Cell did stealth before Conviction. Yeah, I'm, I'm noticing a pattern. To. That is how you do stealth. The challenge comes from the people you're trying to avoid spotting you and timing things right. Not from, yeah, I, I think I've made my point quite clearly. And really, the, you know, forget about the Assassin Templar conflict. The real villain of this series, and has been right from the start, is excessive streamlining and, in general, just bad design decisions, and here it launches its most effective attack. This really, this entry really proves that Brotherhood is the exception to the rule. This series cannot include something positive, improve upon itself, without also taking away something positive or you know, also including something negative. This one is so viciously streamlined that it's gonna turn a lot of people off just from that. Streamlining has always been the problem, but I feel like a new word should be made up with, with the series. I feel like a new word should be made up for this one because it's just so... It, dumbed down is a really good expression for it. You can literally win a fight just by button mashing. Fighting wasn't difficult before, but now it's just ridiculous. To be fair, there are some cha more challenging opponents. They're typically Scotsmen, or at least they, you know, they've got the kilt, and I feel like if you're gonna wear a skirt as a dude, especially back then, you probably want to know how to fight, you know. You're, you're gonna get in a lot of trouble. And just, yeah, in general, a lot of the time I felt like the character was playing the game, more, the, the controlling the game more than I was. And I, when I do these video game reviews, I take notes as I play. With most games, I have to pause and then you know, enter them on my cell phone. With this, and in general, the series, a bit of tendency to, I can basically just play the game with one hand and be typing on my cell with the other, and the game can't even tell the difference. I, I don't do worse by that, so that, that really should tell you something. With the, the streamlining, I, I should probably give some more examples, really, so you can fully appreciate what, what we lose from the earlier games. There is no longer a lock-on feature in single player. It's, it's gone. There is a computer-controlled sort of lock-on, but it's horribly programmed. It's, it's completely... It's not at all trustworthy. And if you want to use the pistol, don't use it when there are several enemies nearby and you, and you care which one you hit, because it's gonna hit the wrong one. And just the... You know, the, the, the issue with the old lock-on was that it it wasn't really a lock-on. It, it would switch if you turned the camera slightly, or if the character you were trying to lock-on moved, completely defeating the purpose of lock-on. So now they just ditch it completely. Free-running, you know, someone must have picked up that I was really fed up with how free-running literally was just, you hold down three buttons, and that's it. Because now it's two. Now it's two. So jump key is 
literally, it, it's basically useless. Play this game, see if you can tell a difference from whether you hold down the jump key or basically you're holding down, you know, the right mouse button and the directional key or keys that you want to use and that's it. What does this do? Well, you can no longer, you know, just hop over a... Actually, I think this is specific to multiplayer, but that's where you really need it. You can't run over a an, an edge as you can in Revelations and this is not like me sugarcoating memories. I play both in multiplayer pretty much every day, so yeah. And I, I literally tested this theory, and yes, you can no longer run over, it will automatically jump, thus giving you fewer strategic opportunities. And if you try to just climb to the edge, you know, hanging on to the edge so you can maybe pull down someone, or maybe you're figuring he's gonna throw a smoke bomb if I climb all the way up. Tough luck, he's gonna climb all the way up, unless it's something where you can't climb all the way up in a single like stride, if you're climbing to the roof of a building, he won't climb all the way up, but you often need, the strategic opportunity is often better of those small ones where you can climb up really fast, so yeah, the, and just in general, the, the you, you jump when you're really not intending to, you'll try to just climb to the top of something, but if you hold on, the button for just a fraction of a second too long because you thought you had to hold on for a little longer, he'll jump and that, that'll that botch something. And one example of this, other than, you know, that it'll mess up stealth for you, is, you know, you now have to collect these almanac pages. Almanac pages? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. You have to chase them down, and this will give you more recipes for crafting. And I will detail crafting a little bit. And, yeah, this is a fine idea. This is not really something we've seen before. Because it literally is just catching the wind, and you can't necessarily tell what direction it's going to blow in, so you have to rush after it. And if you don't catch it within maybe half a minute of it starting to blow away, it's gonna be too caught by the wind or too far away, something, and you'll just have to try again later, you know, it will come back. And that's great, and in general there's there's stuff like that where in this you suddenly have to really quickly do something, and this is in basically a fine enough idea, and it again, it makes the world feel alive, like, oh, now, now or, now or later, not quite now or never, and yeah, it it gives some urgency to it, and this is something this game series has lacked from the beginning, has, has missed from the beginning, and not exactly helped by how few timed objectives there are in this game. They really... I don't know who looked at the other games and said, it's just too hard. It's way too easy, and at this point it's like... It's, it's so easy, that the, the window of opportunity for, like, blocking an opponent's attack, for example, is so wide now that you're probably going to miss it because you think that it's smaller than it is, and you... I, I kept pressing... I don't know, maybe it's just me. I kept pressing a button thinking, ah, I, you know, I was fast enough. No, nope, I was too fast, because the game thinks that I'm much worse at playing it than I actually am, and I actually pressed too soon and thought that I was ready to do the next move. And, yeah, it's, it's like when you play, when you get really good, when you're a, a gamer, you know, you've played a hardcore game, and you've played it on the, the top difficulty, and now you're supposed to be playing, like, a game that children are supposed to be able to beat. I don't know why they want children to be able to beat these games, because they're clearly not for children with the blood and violence and the adult themes, but whatever, they do, for some reason, especially at this point. They, I, I wager a seven-year-old could complete this game, and I'm not even kidding, I'm not exaggerating. And it's just, it's so much more difficult to play that game, to readjust to something that's that easy. And again, there are no difficulty settings, you can't really make it tougher on yourself. Sure, there are optional objectives, but even those, some of the times they're really, really easy, and other times you can botch them immediately after, like, before you even get the mission, the, the optional objective. 
before it shows up on the screen, you'll have botched it. And, and still, they just they don't provide enough challenge. Heck, why not even make, like, why not store how, how fast you solve a mission? Why not s store, like, how seldom you get hit? How, how few enemies you had to take out on a stealth mission? Something, but no, there is just no replayability here. Sure, there's a lot of stuff to, you know, uncover, but that's about it. I suppose I should, yeah, I think I've pretty much made my point there. Before I get to the crafting, I will briefly go into... This only took me 27 hours to complete. I will grant that I'm only at 56% total completion, but that's, you know, that is purely, you know, the, the side stuff. Some of which, again, like the crafting, I've still yet to really figure out how to even complete. And some other side stuff that I'm just having a lot of trouble figuring out how to complete. But anyway, 29 hours, that's just below what Revelations was. And Revelations, let's be honest, Brother and Revelations are basically expansion packs. They barely add to the main elements. And yet, Brotherhood remains the best entry in the entire series, at least if you ask me. Revelations was like 20, 30 one, two, 32 and a half hours, I think, for me. And that was 98% synchronization. So most of the stuff done, and with this, only if you count all the extra stuff, is it longer. And Brotherhood, I don't grant that was with, I think, 100% synchronization. We're talking 64 and a half hours. Something along those lines, at least. So. It's less than half of the expansion pack entry. And this, sure, this is the biggest in some ways, but yeah, there's, there's just this, that little... I really should get into the crafting before I expand on why it's so little. Basically, crafting is that they finally realized it's way too easy to earn money in these games. And now you... Basically, to earn money, you gotta hunt and sell, that's the, the stuff you get, and the better you hunt, the more money the stuff will go for. Or you have to craft. I think that's a way to make money, at least. And crafting is basically that you, you complete these homestead missions to get, like, let's say, woodsmen, or, you know, I don't know, someone who as flowers of forest, whatever, and they will be able to produce different things, and as you help them, you solve small missions for them, you get these extra, they, they will start to produce other goods for you within their area of expertise, and yes, this is basically busy work, a lot of the extra stuff is busy work in this one, and the crafting, in theory, is a good idea, it's, you know, it's a role-playing game element, which is something that you know, if they're not, they're e either they have to make it tougher or they have to add more role-playing game el yeah, elements. Or it's just not going to fly. It's just incredibly boring. People are still buying these games. I don't know why. No disrespect. I just don't personally get it. But whatever. Yeah. So they, they do occasionally in these sequels add role-playing game elements. And sometimes it works out quite well. And yeah, the crafting... In theory, it's a good thing. I didn't really figure it out, so I can't comment too much on it. To me, it seems like really difficult to just even craft very basic stuff. It, you know, getting the materials for it and craftsmen and such. It seems like you have to put in a lot of effort before you can craft much of anything. Now, with the crafting done, Basically, why there is so so little in this, the the main storyline, or not, not really why, but a, a problem with the main storyline is, I already mentioned that Connor is half Native American and half, you know, British, which helps him fit in better in the towns and such, which is probably why you face so little 
abuse. There's really almost no evidence of the slavery and such. To be fair, it does touch upon some more unpleasant aspects of the, you know, the birth of America, I guess, you know, the whole mistreatment of blacks and Americans. But yeah, anyway, half Native American, half British, and clearly, unfortunately, the white bread half is dominant because Connor is so bland. He is the blandest character that we've had, in the main character anyway, that we've had in this series so far. I mean, you've got the basic core elements of the main, of, of the male protagonist in place. He's proud, he is determined, and he's, you know, out to complete some quest of some kind. That was the same as with the others, but the others had more stuff to them, and Connor just doesn't. He's yeah, I, I really don't know what else to say. He's, he's just incredibly bland. And that that's made worse by the fact that the main villain, who I for the longest time didn't even realize was supposed to be the main villain, is just pretty uninteresting. And the sort of conflict between the two I don't know, it's just, it's just not that compelling. I will say that the, like I said, he has a quest of some sort. That main story is another of these classic stories. You know, we have a classic story in the first, the second, and again in this one. And I'm not going to give details on what any of those three are, because I would be giving away spoilers. But it is one of these classic tales, and that is dealt with pretty well, again, in all three. And there's also a key relationship in this, which again, I'm not going to detail, you'll probably figure it out pretty early on, but it's still a spoiler. And they deal with it rather well, they, yeah, I, I don't have more to say on that. now. The I suppose that pretty much covers the the plot. I I will say they continue to make the basic plot and the various characters memorable and interesting. You you tend to care in in this one. I care more about the side characters than the our leads. But yet yeah, still we. You know, they have personalities, and you remember them. That actually does bring me to one of the changes which I think is fairly decent and, and interesting enough. As of Brotherhood, basically getting assassin recruits was basically... I know, I just said basically twice. It was a matter of freeing someone from oppression. Like, you, you know, you see someone being you know, fighting off guards or something, and you kill the guards, and oh, there's another assassin recruit, and you stock up quite a few that way. And yeah, that is maybe a little bit straining credulity, and in this one, you do have to work harder. You don't, you can't get as many assassin recruits, and to get an assassin recruit, and this is also not just someone who just happens to fight off guards, in this, you have to actually free an area of, you know, of one of the cities, you know, because you've got both New York and Boston to get an assassin recruit. And that kind of shows, you know, the, the recruit you get was already kind of, they were living in that section of that city and they were already kind of fighting back and starting to, you know, really do resistance. They weren't just fighting guards, they were serious. They were trying to free their home and their, their and the surrounding area. So when you come to help them, they really are, yeah, okay, you got a partner, buddy. You know, I, I will, you know, follow your leadership and I will train to become an assassin because you freed my home. 
And yeah, that's. I, I feel like you know, anytime the this series makes you work for something, it's a good thing because they they tend to not do that well at that. I still think the crafting goes too far in that regard, but yeah, in this, it's it's a really great thing. And every time you do this, you also gain another ability of the assassins, and that basically leads into that the assassins now take on the the role of all of the groups that are for hire, you know, that again, since, that, that's actually since Assassin's Creed 2. You've got the courtesans who can distract, you know, or, well basically they're a walking, what's it called, blend field. You've got the, yeah, courtesans, you've got the thieves who you can send to lure someone away so that the guards will go away from where they are and you can sneak past, you know. And you've got the mercenaries who will very poorly, I might add, fight alongside you. And all of these are now done by assassins, which means, and there's both good and bad to this, the bad is that you lose a lot of the life of the the world of you know this this time period and this country because before you you know you had missions to solve for these people you'd go and beat up you know bad johns you know the the courtesans clientele you know you'd beat them up for the courtesans you'd help the thieves out with you know, another group of thieves who were like really, you know, nasty, who would like beat up people in addition to stealing from them and, you know, stuff like this. And you'd thus gain their respect and you could, you know, you could unlock an ability of theirs and you could, you, you could get them to lower their rate and such. And yeah, here everything, every side quest is either like anonymous, like you know, the crafting is basically just linked to you know money and well you can craft certain objects and some of those you can actually use for yourself. And then you've got like other you know ana anonymous stuff like delivering the letters, which again is still not time. They really need to learn from the Grand Theft Auto. I have not played Grand Theft Auto since like Vice City. I know, I am getting to Grand Theft Auto 4, and in that there were, you know, you could, like an ambulance, a fire truck, you could be a pizza delivery boy, taxi, you could take a police car, and all of those had timed objectives specific to the vehicle that you had taken, and it was fun and, yeah, challenging, but anyway. It's either anonymous or it's directly related to the core conflict of Assassins vs. Templars. Now, the I think that might more or less cover the negatives. Now, the positives are that before it was kind of obvious when, when there would be a group of courtesans or thieves nearby, it was like, ah, I probably have to use them somewhere nearby. Although, you could eventually, like, you know, create specific buildings for them to start out, but, you know, still it was a little obvious in that regard. Now you can call upon them any time, basically. I suppose that's good as well as bad. And the good thing of the, being able to call them, of them being assassins now, is that that counts away from, you still have the little bars that count how many assassin recruits you have, and each one now represents just one, so that's also more, it just feels more natural in a way, before it would be like anywhere between like one to three, and that just feels, I don't know. As far as I can tell though, the arrow, hail of arrows, whatever it was called, is gone now. Anyway, yeah, the, so 
sure, you can hire them anytime, but it's going to take away from that. And remember, if you send them on missions, you're not going to be able to do that, you know, to call upon them in those. So you got to plan there. And again, that's good. And especially with this more limited amount. Actually, to be fair, they... Yeah, never mind. Scratch that one. And the... I suppose that pretty well covers that. I think there's maybe one or two new abilities there as well. Like you can have your assassin recruits dress up as enemy soldiers and take you prisoner and lead you directly past guards and you know, into a secure area or the like. And that's pretty cool. And that also makes sense. That really fits with the whole assassin thing. Now. I should talk some about some of the new aspects. The hunting, I feel like it wasn't, it doesn't really achieve its full potential. Like for example, you still don't have any kind of like, you know, the sense of time passing is still just limited to weather and night and day mechanics. There is no like, you don't have to make sure you have enough food to eat, for example, or you know, earn rent to pay so that you and you have a certain amount of in-game time to earn that. So yeah, I don't know. Some would say that would be taking it too far in you know into a role-playing game. Some would say it would be taking too much freedom away. I can see that, but I still just you gotta really make it into something. And basically, what it comes down to is you're earning money from it, and you know sometimes getting stuff that you have to you know, use for crafting or that people would like you to get for them. Like, one guy asked me for wolf fang, so obviously I had to go kill some wolves. Essentially, hunting does come down to stealth assassination of animals, and that's really too bad. They do give you some nice tools for it, and they do actually, you know, you do earn more money for selling it, from how well you kill them, so the stealthier you are, you know, and, and what you use for it. Sure, it's easy to just take out an animal at a distance with a bow and arrow, but I'd also mention it's pretty cool. You get arrows back if you loot or skin, in the case of animals, the carcass or body that you shot with the arrow, so that's quite nice. But, you know, yeah, if you actually manage to sneak up on something or do an air assassination, maybe, I, I haven't really looked into, but supposedly you earn more money from how well you do. And again, you know, actually rewarding effort put into the game, very good thing. And it generally is, it's almost downright difficult to earn money in this game. I certainly never did a lot of it, but yeah, again, that is, that is a good thing. It was, it's definitely... We definitely needed to go away from it being so freaking easy, you know, before you just had to wait and the money would roll in pretty much by itself and save up, buy something expensive, you gave it even more money and yeah, just putting in time, basically, yeah. And so, so yes, the, the hunting, basically the animals are extremely aware of you and they do actually behave as that animal would so and, and there are various different animals you know you will hunt rabbits who will obviously run away really fast and you won't often be able to you know chase down your prey pretty much you know anyway you can also go up against elk and the females will run off, whereas the males will come right at you with those big antlers. And bears, as well, will actually, you know, try to fight you if you, you know, if they notice you. So, yeah. And you can still kill them. I wish it would pretty much be near impossible as it would be in real life. You'd be lucky to get alive away from it, you know just wounding it and getting away from it, especially the bear. I, I don't know exactly about an elk, but I could imagine, I mean, that thing 
If, if that rammed you with those antlers, you'd probably be looking at broken ribs at the very least, not really moving away from there happily. So yeah, anyway, it's basically QTEs, and it's disgustingly easy. And again, you just, you, you kill, and, and bear killing thus also just becomes too easy, and at points there's like a mission where you even have to go kill several bears, I think. And it just, it becomes so commonplace that you lose respect for the animals, and through that you, again, missed opportunity. Everything just comes so freaking easy to these assassins, so don't know exactly why they haven't won the war against the Templars yet, but some nice stuff is, to, as far as the hunting goes, is I want to mention the tools. You can also now hide in, like, tall grass and the like. You know, Connor will automatically crouch down, and you can... You'll auto wall hug, which is really infuriating, because it'll almost always do it when you don't want it to. But from the auto wall hug, you can launch into a climb with just at the press of the jump button, which, again, can cause trouble. And you can whistle to lure, you know, guards to you and the like. But yeah, so there is that way of getting closer. And you'll, you'll be looking for clues. I, Eagle Vision sort of helps with this, but frankly, I forgot about Eagle Vision in this game, and I feel like the developers did too. You barely use it. I don't know why it, they don't have you, like, finding tracks like that, but instead it just kind of points, oh, there's something you can go and investigate, and you go and just press the use button, and it just tells you exactly what it is. It's not even like a, you know, well, you have these factors, so can you from that figure out what this might mean? Nope, it's just, oh, well, there's this, and it's just, again, it's too easy like that. But yeah, the tools are bait, and these snares, and the bait is completely, you know, universal. I don't know if that is like that in real life. If there is universal bait, again, I would prefer that you had really specific ones. But that's, you know, that's not this franchise. By the way, you can't craft bombs anymore. That really cool thing about Revelations where they finally got to, you know, giving you choices and, you know, you... Yeah, just gone. You can't even aim, not in single player anyway, throwables anymore. And the smoke bomb, I actually, for a while I wondered, do I even have smoke bombs? And I just found some, oh, I guess I do, but can't aim them. I never even used them, so again, it feels like, well, they were in the other game, sure, let's put them in. Anyway, the, yeah, you've got this bait that will attract nearby animals, again, unless they sense that you're nearby. And they are really good at that, realistically good at that. And you have these snares, which, you know, if you combine the bait and the snare, you have a pretty good chance of, you know, catching some. And they actually do this very nicely. If you place that where rabbits might go come by, for example, and then check back in a little while, you know, stay away from the snares, because you're going to scare the prey away. They can't tell that there's a snare there, but they can t tell that there's a living, breathing, you know, animal, a human being there. So, yeah, just stay away, come back a little later, and there might be something in the snare. So that's, that's how you should approach that. And yes, you can skin any animal that you've killed, or that is killed near you, and this will grant you the, you know, the skin, if it's a wolf, maybe the fangs, stuff like this, and you can sell them. Now, I think that pretty much covers the hunting. So, yes, apart from, I mentioned that you can air assassinate them. And, yes, the tree free running, or tree running, as I like to call it, is indeed in this game. And for a while it seems fun, but then you realize that it's entirely linear, and linear free running is an oxymoron. I don't know why they... I mean, I can tell why it turned out like that, because how do you do... Excuse me. Yes, I'm, I'm very rich. How do you do tree running and not make it linear, but then 
The answer is don't make tree running. Don't do it if it's going to be that linear. And the regular free running is also, there are far too few rooftops to jump from and to in these. I, maybe it is realistic for how New York and Boston looked back then, but again, then don't make that the setting because that's, that's what we want in Assassin's Creed. That's part of what we play the games for, you know. And, yeah, and, and the tree running is very hard. It, it takes a very hard hit from the streamlining where you really can't tell what your character is going to do from you. There, there were times where I thought I was jumping out of a tree and I was just jumping to another tree. And, yeah, so that loses a lot from there. Now, the... With the free running, I really do also have to get into the bugs and glitches that I mentioned earlier. There haven't been that many in this series, but in this one, there really are, like, basically, in single player, stay away from these little, like, just in front of windows, there are these two or three planks. And if you step onto those, you're pretty much guaranteed. It uh, certainly that's my experience with it. That you're you'll be stuck somehow, some way, and you'll you'll have to just reload last checkpoint. And yeah, it's and and yeah, thankfully that is actually they might have had that before, but it also now resets option objectives, which. Yeah, that really infuriated me that, that, that the other ones did not do that, so, yeah. But yeah, I eventually just had to stay away from those entirely. And, yeah, just often the character will suddenly fall down for no discernible reason. Like, I, I was trying to climb a building, and when Connor landed, he, he clearly landed properly, and I, pre I didn't press a button, and then suddenly, he fell backwards all the way down, and it was impossible for me to grab onto something midair. So yeah, a lot of stuff like that, and in multiplayer. And to be fair, this appears to be a Ubisoft server issue, because it happens in Revelations as well. But I played every day of the week, and I'd say three times a week, at least. There's slowdown leading me to lose a contract or mess something up somehow. Suddenly, someone who's running 10 feet away from me is right in front of me. You know, stuff like that. So, yeah, that's really annoying. And with that, I really do have to say that one of the big issues with this is... I'm gonna get philosophical up in this bitch just for a little bit. To achieve greatness. I got this straight from Sung Tzu. Now, to achieve greatness, you gotta know your limitations and you gotta work with what you've got. You have to make compromises so that what you put out, because if you don't put out, boys are not gonna like you, is... does not show scars, does not have a lot of problems with it as aforementioned bugs and glitches, and Ubisoft just refused to do so. Compromises are not made, and so we can tell where the programming stopped, you know, working well. There, there are huge AI issues as well. I, I was at one point chased by enemies who hadn't even seen me. I could be seen through a wall at one point, and yeah, sometimes enemies just behave very, very strangely. It happens often enough that it's an issue. And, yeah, they... And, and the graphics engine, you can tell the exact line. You can tell exactly where they crossed the line into where it just couldn't take it anymore. You know, the... the little graphics engine that just couldn't take it anymore. It just... And it's sad. It really... Some of the trees, I kid you not, we are talking early 3D stuff 
here. We're talking Duke Nukem 3D, you know, the, the kind of axis stuff where they're just two flat surfaces and you're supposed to accept that as actually 3D. That's the level we're talking about some of the time here. They should have just admitted that they couldn't pull this off well and just not put it in there. To get back to some of the positives, because there really are positives in this, it really is a big game. We have these two big cities, Boston and New York, and the vast frontier to explore. And might I remind you, the frontier is not exactly this flat, arid desert. You can't just run in various directions. It's not like the construct or the animus. No, it literally has, you know, trees and mountains and rivers. You know, you can, there's a really tall point, a really low point. And it really is fascinating to run around. There was one point where I spotted a bear trying to catch fish with its paw, literally standing the way you see on photographs or on nature videos. They really do well. Animal animations are so realistic. They are so true to life. I may before have mentioned that my father keeps chickens, so I've seen, you know, I've, I've seen what it's like to feed chickens and, you know, what what they act like. And in this game, every every farm animal you meet, you can pet. I say farm animal because, you know, the, the animals in the wild, as well as the occasional guard dog, which, again, they're so rare, I don't know why they bothered to put them in, although they're, they're a decent enough addition because they obviously can tell where you are sometimes better than the guards. They'll know to check if you're just hiding nearby. They can smell you. You know, and if you approach sneakily behind the guards, the dog will bark before the guards will sense something and turn around. So there's that. But anyway, every farm animal you can pet, and you know, chickens and like, what's it called? The the turkeys. You know, you can you know feed them. You know, they've got to grow nice and fat to you know be slaughtered and eaten. After all, I think pigs. You also just. Feed. You, know, you don't really want to go up and like try to pet a pig. It's gonna run off squealing. I'm pretty sure they're not exactly <laughs> that comfortable around those that they are not already very comfortable with. So anyway, how you know if you if you approach a cow, it'll just stand there and you can like pat its back. It'll just stand standard, not really noticing. A cat, you'll like you know it'll it'll purr and it'll go back and forth between your legs with its tail, you know, caressing you and stuff like that, you know. You can scratch a, a dog, what, I, I don't know the exact word, but you know, the way people would pet a dog. And it'll like roll over and, you know, pant in front of you, wag its tail, maybe even follow you for a little bit and, you know, stuff like that. It makes the world feel very alive. I would add that if, on the negative of that, they still don't quite have the Grand Theft Auto thing of, you know, you can't, like, start a fight. You can't bump into someone and have them, like, attack. Well, actually, yeah, now that I think about it, you could in some of the other games if you... Actually, I think if you stole from them. To be fair, I have not... I didn't steal from that many in this one, so I don't know for sure. But it just... I don't know, you can't make much out of that. That You know what? Scratch that. I don't know for sure if... But anyway, it still doesn't quite have the, you know, my, my friend mentioned that he had tried, like, getting, provoking a biker in Grand Theft Auto to hitting him, and there was a cop nearby, and the cop arrested the biker and, like, drove off with him. That's awesome, and I, I don't see that happening in, you know, in this game, if, if, the law enforcement would arrive, they would probably just fight you, so, yeah. Now, the... As far as... Realism... I suppose that might more or less cover that aspect. Now, the missions are fairly varied, and I like that several of... a lot of them you're kind of just thrown into, like, you don't know what the mission is before you start it, and some of them are literally like, oh, run, chase down that guy, or really quickly do this or that. And, yeah, that's kind of cool, but they are entirely...
entirely linear, again really defying this key concept of a very free and open world. You don't get to creatively think out a solution to a mission, you're just... The, the hand-holding in the game is simultaneously excessive and... I don't know, it's not enough. Yeah. Because, like I said, you have all these new abilities and they don't tell you how to use them. I could not find anything in the, the game manual that told me how to use these various things. But yeah, and at the same time you have these missions where you're just supposed to do this very specific thing. Early on, several missions were literally just sneak for a few seconds, okay, mission over. And that's... yeah. They're, they're way more interested in the story than in challenging gameplay. And again, they, they've been that since the inception of this series, but here it really, really got bad. Now, the... One thing that they do well in this is you finally get more than one pistol to choose from. That's, again, one of these big things that, you know, yeah, you, you only have one pistol in the other games. And so there's no choosing which one to bring and the like. In this one you have the basic one, and then you have one that... It's basically a double barrel. And it's not a shotgun, it really is just a pistol. It's still, you know, you can only kill one person with each bullet, but you can fire both barrels in quick succession. And then you have one that I guess it's sort of supposed to be like a shotgun. It has like three barrels and spreads it more. And they're like going off and it's like a side, but with, you know, barrels. So they, they spread slightly. I didn't really see it killing several, but it can like momentarily stun several. So there's, there's that. And I might not have just not have been able to, like I said, I don't, I usually don't use a pistol when there's more than one person around because he'll fire in the wrong direction. There were like three persons, three people to the left of me and I pressed fire and then he shot to the right where there was only one guy so I kind of gave up on that. Besides, it uses three bullets and I was only carrying eight. You might be able to upgrade that again. I didn't really, I didn't buy stuff because I had so much trouble, you know, earning money in this game so yeah. And that. I suppose the... In multiplayer, it takes a full two minutes between matches. And I suppose that is so that you can browse through the typically empty, updated menus of the, the match. I don't even know why they included them when they're not. When I play Revelations, after each match, I can tell what accolades did I earn, what... It was, okay, you can that here too, but I can also tell what challenges I made progress in. I have not been able to tell that here. And it, it just shows... The, it shows cold stats instead. It just shows, like, you've completed so and so many challenges and accolades. Why don't you tell me then what I'm missing, or what I'm almost done with, or the like? But no, it's just cold stats, and you have to go in and slowly scroll through these menus where all of it is. And the menus are such a maze at this point. In both single player and multiplayer, it's actually two separate mazes. Maybe that's why you have so much time, so that you can just, you know, yeah, try to dig your way through that. I don't know why they changed the old system, which worked perfectly fine for several games in a row, but yeah. And yeah, these two minutes, and that does include the time where, you know, the, the period of time where the, the characters are literally just facing off and saying, going grrr to each other. And, you know, keep in mind, if you're playing a team mode, you might not even be able to select a character. And for some reason, the bottom menu is the one where you vote for what level to... I, I would put that first, especially since you can't just press up and go to the bottom. You have to scroll all the way down. Yeah, that is kind of nitpicky, but it's just... Again, it's an example of bad design decisions. And two minutes, that is... It seems like they're just daring people to quit. 
And a lot of the time that's what happens. I'd say a third of the time people quit while waiting for a rematch. And it's really frustrating. It's, it happens far more often than in Revelations. And yes, I, you know, to be fair, I timed Revelations as well, and that was about a minute and 45 seconds. But in that time, you can actually look stuff up. You can select a character or just... And it doesn't feel like as long. And it, it implements the voting. It, it kind of tells you, here, go ahead, vote. You don't have to vote, but here's, I think it's like 10 seconds. If you want to vote, go ahead and vote. It, it puts it up front and center, you know. And, of course, with the story, you meet and interact with numerous historical figures, actual historical figures, who whose names and, you know, what, what they were responsible for would probably mean something to you if you hadn't spent, you know, every single high school history class just ogling that, you know, hot chick who was way out of your league anyway. The... I've already mentioned that the fighting gets much easier. For some reason, a lot of the time it goes straight to the insta-kill here. It's not even like a combination, it's just you can press the button and it'll instantly kill a lot of the enemies with just that one attack. And it's also for some reason much more focused on this action than the stealth. Again, we, we play Assassin's Creed for the stealth more than the action, I, at least I would say. They, they do make some of the enemies seem imposing, but you know, that goes away once you realize how easily defeated they are. But for example, even in the frontier, there are these troop concentrations, these little, I don't know, platoons, I guess, maybe it's, I, I don't know, that much military lingo, Roger Echo. Yeah, the, you know, five guys, and they'll like literally be like beating the drum, so you can hear them from a distance before you see them, maybe even before they turn up on your radar, you can hear the drums, and it's like, you know, again, until you realize how easy they are. But that's, it's potentially effective, certainly, and it actually might, at points, force you to very quickly hide, or, you know, take a longer road, or wait for them to, you know, to get past you, because, you know, they do move. And they also have this, these, Firing squads, basically, because you know now you've got the muskets, and you can also pick up the muskets and use. And basically, a lot of the enemies will, you know, especially if there's like two or three enemies just standing with with their muskets, and you're fighting other people, they will stand and get ready to fire. And you will be notified of this with the camera changing angles. And if the game feels like it, maybe you can press space and use the nearest guard as a human shield and, you know, thus avoid the bullets. Unfortunately, even if you don't, and like I said, it doesn't work, I don't know, maybe a third of the time at least, it does not work, period. And again, it, it's just pressing space, so if, if, you, if the game doesn't feel like it, you'll not only not be able to run off and try to, you know, minimize the damage, no, you'll be, I think, yeah, space is, if you're in battle, usually it's just like break defense of the enemy that the, you know, computer lock-on mechanism has decided to lock on to, and that'll leave you even more exposed. But yeah, even if you take one, sometimes even two, straight hit, and again, we're talking like three people at least firing. I think at one point it was like five or six, and they could fire at least once, sometimes twice, and I could just keep moving. You know, pr we're talking pretty much point blank. I don't even know how, how you do that, but whatever. And I just don't understand why they didn't... Okay, so the human shield idea isn't terrible. It does require that an enemy is close by and the game feels like doing that. Why not just 
put it on, you know, make another toggle key. That's what works in this game. You know, if you suddenly use a key that you don't usually use for fighting. Let's, uh, R, for example. You use R to change your weapon. You don't use that for fighting. Let's say you press R and, you know, Connor just jumps to the ground instantly. If you only press R, because if you hold it down, you open up, you know, the inventory. That seems to me like it would work fine, and they could make a nice small window of opportunity. Do it too soon, and they just aim down. Do it too too late, and you still get shot. You know that kind of thing. And from jumping out, and I'm sorry, my father was in the military. I'm I'm not trying to toot anyone's horn here, but. I ask him, and he he keeps confirming. Best thing to do if you're getting shot at, try to you know get out of the way. Don't try to get a human shield where it might jump down. What what are they gonna do if you time it right? They're not gonna hit you, and they're gonna be slightly confused by it. That's that's what you do, and yeah. Anyway, on the subject of you know holding down a button to open a menu. If you hold down the E button, you open the Assassin menu, and in there you can choose between their various abilities, same as you know, holding down R. And if you just press E, you will activate the selected ability if you are currently, you know, let's say you have Assassinate as the current ability. If you're not pointing towards someone you can assassinate, obviously it's not going to do something. And by the way, they finally took away your ability to kill civilians. I don't know why it took them five games, but whatever. If you hold down and then press left click, and again, I noticed this basically by accident, you know, randomly, and that's how I noticed a lot of things in this game. If you hold down the E button and then position your mouse correctly, I think you have to point to the icon that tells you to left click and then left click, then you open your Assassin's Guild menu. I actually thought that they hadn't included it. But then that's where it is, and so yeah, you can always tell them to go right there. I don't know what was wrong with the chicken, uh, the pigeon coops. I thought it was great. I liked that you had to go to a certain place to, you know, and and you would attach a little message to a pigeon and send it off, and then they would go off to a mission. You know, again, it made it seem more real. It made the world feel more like our own, and it made you have to actually do something. It's not like there were a few pigeon coops, they were all over. And you still, you ha just had to make your way to a pigeon coop to send them off. And now you can send them off anytime you want. So, yeah. Not really anything to say about the Assassin's Guild. It hasn't really changed. Now, I really should talk about the yeah, there, there are at least two positive aspects. I've already slightly touched upon that they do actually go into the culture here, and I'm going to make a very declarative statement to, to, to hammer home my point here. For the first time in this series, you genuinely feel the culture of your protagonist. You get into the Native American culture and, and psyche, the music, you, you get, you know, you're early on, you, you, you're in the village and you can go back and visit it later as well. And I already mentioned the language, you know, and they didn't like tone down, the, the appearances of the Native Americans are not toned down, they're not, they're not ridiculed either, they're, you know, they, they just, they, they come off as very real, and their, their beliefs, and when you actually, when you skin an animal, like, I don't, I'm not sure he necessarily continues doing it, but at least early on, your, you know, Connor will literally thank the animal for its sacrifice, for giving the, the skin and meat to the hunter, and that is consistent with primitive beliefs, and I should maybe, to avoid offending anyone, the word primitive, to some it has a negative connotation, in reality it shouldn't, because 
prime. It, it, yeah, primitive just means like first, like prime. You know, primary, the, the initial. It's the, the, you know, the, the civilization, primitive civilization came before modern civilization. That's all it means. It doesn't say that it's, you know, barbaric. That's not inherent in the word primitive. But yeah, all these aspects very, very nicely put in and I really felt, you know, yeah, I, I felt Native American or I felt like I was exploring the world of the Native Americans and I, I'm, I'm very impressed with that and I think it's also very gutsy of them to have this Native American protagonist. That's not very typical in, you know, pop culture. And when you think about, I mean, the, the whole thing of Assassin, that's not that difficult to make appealing to, you know, the masses. Maybe especially these days. I think there's a, a bit of a romanticized... I'm not complaining about that. I, I love, you know, Hitman, you know, Agent 47 myself, so... And, I don't know, the... Well, I suppose I'll say here was also a little bit of a different, but, you know, the, the suave Italian and, you know, exploring the world of the Renaissance, those are already pretty, you know, I mean, people talking about traveling, a lot of it's going to be like Italy or that kind of thing, you know, and the, yeah, the, the suave Italian, yeah. So, they, they do that really, really well, and it's, yeah, I, I hope they do it more with some of the, you know, following games, or at least take an equally compelling approach to something. Now, the, the multiplayer has seven maps, where, by comparison, Revelations has about eight, but some of those are the same at different, you know, different times of day and the like. This has seven maps, and all of them have three ambiances. Sunny day, starry night, and overcast. And one of these maps just, you know, obviously all of them are related in some way to the settler period of America. One of them is entitled Animus Core, and I really love that they did this because it's it was too awesome not to at some point. It literally is an incomplete Animus rendering of, I guess it's basically a city. Yeah, a, a, a city in early America. And all over you see where the Animus isn't done rendering, so you see these white blocks. There's, there's one part of the level that has just a stick hanging in the air that you can jump and launch further, you know, with, with the free running. And it's literally just hanging there, and you don't know exactly what it was supposed to be, but you can tell it's not done rendering it. And yeah, it's, it's just really, really cool how they've actually made that. Now, as far as the multiplayer goes, it has a lot of tiny fixes, and most of these are for the better. You have a multi-kill and bonus... what's it called? Actually, bonus. It's, it's a... variety. Counter. So basically, if, if one of your allies kills someone, there will be this meter that will very quickly run out, telling you one of your allies just kill someone, quickly kill someone else, and you'll earn the multi-kill bonus. Or, or another multi-kill, whatever. And you can get like four times multi-kill bonus if you do really well at it. And the variety, it will tell you, you know, now you have like, the first time you do one, it's like one out of five. And when it gets to five out of five, ah, you know, basic variety, extra bonus. And then next time it'll count up to ten, you know, starting from five, obviously, and to fifteen for extreme variety, something like that. And that's really cool, so you don't have to sit there and think, you know. And when you get killed, you can check by pressing tab, for like also checking score, you can tell what made the, the enemy 
earn the amount of points that he did, if you're at all wondering about that. And that's extremely helpful because, you know, especially for people who aren't quite into the multiplayer, maybe this is the first time you play the multiplayer aspect of one of these Assassin's Creed games, for whatever reason, it'll really help. And if you are playing multiplayer and you're having a little bit of a midlife crisis, you're regretting some of the decisions that you made, namely your choice of set, set up, you know, what, what you bring into the match. You can literally press, I think it's like shift and tab. Again, combine keys, keep doing this Assassin's Creed. It's working for you. It's the one thing you, it's one of the few things you've really got going for you. And it'll cost you, I think, 80 of the Abstergo credits, which I think you also earn quicker. It sounds like a lot if you're comparing it to Revelations, but you earn much quicker, which is also why things are more expensive. And yeah, you can literally mid-match change your setup. You'll also respawn, I believe. But yeah, it's basically, you know, the respawn function in a multiplayer game. And as you you know, choose another setup, it costs you. I, I think it's reasonable enough, personally, at least. And, yeah, great addition. Now, the various characters in multiplayer are also quite nice, very diverse, and nicely done, and they're basically all takes on the idea of the Native American, the settler, or the pirate. And, yeah, you know, you've, you've got the, the Irish carpenter, you've got the young male thief, you know, you've got the young female Indian, you've got the elderly, you know, Indian. There, there's an Inuit Indian, like, I guess, down from Canada or something, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite cool. And customization in multiplayer is insane. It is just so vast with the possibilities. You can go in and change very specific things, like the face, there's right down to like scarring and the like. And, you know, customizing your symbol, you can now scale the symbol, move it within the little sphere. You can't move where it is on your character, but, you know, you can scale and move it within that sphere. You can scale the, the What's it called? The pattern, I think. And there are a lot, I think there are a lot more patterns, at least. And the color, you can choose from every color in the bow, man. Every color in the spectrum. So, yeah, big thumbs up to that. Now, eavesdropping and horse riding and the horse whistle are back. You know, having taken, the horses were only gone for, you know, revelations, but I don't even remember, was eavesdropping even in the second game? It was definitely the first one, but anyway. And, yeah, both static eavesdrops and some mobile ones. And, yeah, it's, it's quite cool. And you have this, like, it'll, it has this circle that you have to remain in. No matter if they're moving or whatever, and you obviously can't be spotted while you're doing that. That's where they do some good stuff. Again, unless it gets really frustrating because your character does something you didn't ask him to do. Now, yes, to, to, uh, I should speak more about the multiplayer, and that pretty much also is what's left. I should maybe also quickly note the basic time period here is 1753 to 1783. Actually, I do also got to talk about the ships. I guess I'll close on that. Basically, multiplayer does away with no less than four modes, only adding two. I don't know why. Again, they can't put something nice in without taking something nice away. Escort, chest capture, steal the artifact, and corruption, gone. I don't know why. I, I liked all those modes. To be fair, at least Escort and Chest Capture have been in two multiplayer games by now. I don't know why Steel the Artifact and Corruption only got to be in Revelations, anyway. And again, as I say about the, you know, the changes in, in multiplayer with these games, they continue to support the older ones. You know, I haven't played Brotherhood multiplayer in a while because there's 
much less to unlock. They didn't even have prestige mode. You know, once you reach level 50 on the basic, you enter prestige mode. And I don't, I haven't really looked at what it reaches in Assassin's Creed 3, but in Revelation, certainly there's like a level 99 of prestige mode. And to reach one level of prestige mode, you again have to reach level 50 of a regular mode. So yeah, that's like a hundred times reaching level 50. So yeah, that, that's going to take a while. Anyway, if you don't like the changes, you can go back and play one of the other ones. You know, there's you know, basically nothing stopping you there. So that's at least nice. Because there are some things... You know, Artifact Assault has a completely different dynamic now because they only have the regular compass when someone has taken your flag, your, your artifact. Freudian slip. And the rest of the time it's just the proximity compass. I prefer it the old way. Some people... But again, it, it completely changes it and now it's a, a new experience. So again, you know, it's, it's good that they're changing things up. Whether you ultimately like their changes or not, as long as their changes aren't completely destroying something, you know. Anyway, the... Yeah, the, the new modes, I wouldn't really compare too much to the ones lost. But, to, to get more into it, basically, one of the new modes... I should maybe quickly state about both modes. They are additional modes that do something that has really been lacking in multiplayer. They don't necessarily take 10 minutes to an entire game, pretty much regardless. You know? Again, I don't know why they removed corruption, because that certainly had that potential based on how the match will go, but anyway. Both Domination and Wolfpack, they can last 10 minutes, but they're not necessarily going to. Domination is exactly what you think it is, and yeah, that was basically the last type of, you know, multiplayer, first person or third person, shooter or that fighting game action kind of thing. You know, where that, that mode that was missing. So, yeah, you capture areas. And the great twist of the Assassin's Creed multiplayer is to capture, you just have to remain inside this circle, which is, of course, you know, if it's, if it's currently held by the opposing team, then the entire area around it, not just the circle, is going to be their territory where they can kill you and you can only stun them. And once you're inside the circle, and alive, you're going to be capturing. It doesn't matter how many of the enemy are in there. So if you can manage to jump back and forth between different, you know, raised places, or if you're running back and forth, and maybe, you know, stunning them usually with the aid of, like, knives or the smoke bomb, the like, you're still going to be capturing it. As long as you're alive, you're going to be capturing, so it's it's actually a lot easier, typically, to capture than to defend, because to defend, you have to root out every single enemy within the circle. And keeping in mind, yes, that was awkward, keeping in mind, they, they can be, you know, they can still use decoys, they can still put on disguises, and like I said, they can stun you, and that's not going to do anything to, you know, the fact that you're there doesn't ensure that you'll be defending. You have to snuff them out. And in fact, if you're staying really obvious and they stun you before you do any, you know, kill any of them, yeah, that's probably not going to be that good of a tactic for you. So yeah, there's... And, and you will reach the titular domination if you control all three points at the same time. And the reason that this is not, like, unfair is, again, it is easier to capture than to defend them. And if you're, you know, and, and keeping in mind you only have to have one player per, you know, you'll typically be three, at least three players on a team. You know, you can't play with only two players on each team, you know, four players minimum, but, you know, and you can play as much as eight people total, so four of you. That leaves at least one person to try to capture every of the, you know, domination checkpoints, 
at the same time, so the defenders have their work cut out for them. You know, so it's a very, very tense match. And there's a meter at the top, which starts completely even between both sides. And as you capture points and keep points, this meter will shift in favor of one or the other. And if one, play, one, one team has two, then it will push in that direction, which is why there are three. There's an uneven number, so that it will usually be pushing in one direction or the other. It won't often stand still, you know. And if you have all three, then it will be very quickly pushing in one direction. So, yeah, you really do want to make sure to very quickly capture these points back. And, yeah, if it reaches one side entirely before 10 minutes are up, then that's that match. I've experienced it happen in less than five minutes if one team is really owning the crap out of the other. So yeah, very, very intense. And basically, the wolf pack, I suppose you could compare somewhat to escort, only there are no, there are no players defending the AI targets. And the AI targets don't just necessarily, don't, don't just run away. They, they have various personality traits. They're, they have different degrees of paranoia, it's, or just perception, I guess it's not really paranoia if someone's after you. At least that's what I tell myself, and Bob over here. Anyway, the, yeah, different degrees of perception, and they might, they might run away, or they might re react aggressively, they might stun you if they notice you. And typically they'll be grouped, and you have four targets at the same time often. And basically, you start with like a minute, maybe a minute and a half. And within that time, you have to kill those four targets and get enough points to reach the next level, and the level after that. And obviously, these levels require more and more points. And the faster you do, the more time you earn. And uh, yeah, so... What you'll want to do is coordinate, because these four guys are standing in the same place. You want to, each of your teammates to kill one designated one. And remember, you can't tell who your allies have already targeted, so you won't accidentally target the same one. So the sooner you target the right ones, and then sneak nice and close, and you know, you, you got to think, do I want to risk, do I want to risk getting an incognito, maybe even a focus bonus, at the risk of him discovering me and stunning me, or running off, and, you know, possibly botching some of these bonuses completely, you know, possibly alerting the others, and, you know, stuff like this. So, yeah, you really want to, it's, it's very much about coordination, and something that really is not present that much in the multiplayer of Assassin's Creed. It can be, but often it's not stealth. You know, it, it, there's a lot of maybe like hiding, but not a lot of sneaking from place to place and sneaking up on a target. Or at least there's too much of the target might as well just, you know, attack you. So really you might as well just rush right at them or incapacitate them and then we're not talking that much stealth anymore. Or maybe I'm just too much of a perfectionist and purist when it comes to stealth. And guilty as charged. Anyway, it's a ton of fun. It's really intense. And it... So, sort of, you know, goes for some of the Left 4 Dead crowd. Although, there's still not a menu of, like, at least, I'm pretty sure there isn't, so I guess it's still just microphone communication, but, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, and it's very intense, and like I said, it, it may last a lot less than 10 minutes, and if you get all the way there, I'm not sure how long exactly it might last, but, it won't necessarily be just 10 minutes, so yeah, it, it mixes it up a bit, it makes it more interesting. Now, in multiplayer, there is, there, there are a few new abilities. The, and, and some of the old ones are like combined, they're, I'm not sure they really removed it, I know, I don't think they re removed any, they just combined some of the old ones. I, I should, before I forget, there's one of the, yeah, one, one of the kill streak ones is a morph one. I think it morphs up to like 15 nearby if you kill like six people. 
or four stealthily uh, you know, silent kills. That's pretty cool. That's a very nice, you know, yeah, streak to have. Anyway, the, the new actual abilities are... I should maybe start with Mute, because Mute has been there before, but it's now called Wipe, and it's actually useful now, because it has range. I, yeah, and it, it actually lasts, like, several seconds, not just like one and a half or so. So yeah, that it's, it's finally useful. And because of the range, it's also a lot clearer. It has this big, like, bubble or, or sphere kind of effect. So you can tell from a, a distance away, someone just used wipe. You know, if you want to maybe head over there. If it's like, say it's assassinate, and you see someone use wipe, you know, ah, there's someone right over there, I better get over there and avoid being spotted, you know, something like that. And then you have Glimmer, which I think is ingenious. It makes you basically invisible. Not for very many seconds, and you're only completely invisible if you stand still. But it's highly useful, because, again, like I already mentioned domination. Say you get into the domination circle without having been, like, particularly spotted. Maybe you even get there when there isn't an enemy quite nearby. If you stand near someone who looks like you, or just stand somewhere randomly, and then you activate that, and you just stand still, because that'll, that'll do it, that'll help you capture that point, and an enemy comes running by, and he's like, where the crap is he? And you can just stun him right there. You can also use it to kill. It's, it's really, really cool. And then you have the Animus Shield, which really, really mixes stuff up. It's really cool. Literally, it'll block abilities. Only one per charge, and it starts out with one charge, and you can craft it, as usual, that is still there. And, you know, if you want, sure, you can give it three charges, but then you won't be, you know, giving, then you won't be expanding its time. You know, personally, I like give it some, you know, longer duration and then, you know, one more charge. So, you know, if I'm running towards an enemy and I activate that, they can throw a knife at me, they can try to smoke me only after using two abilities at me, or if they wait until it's, you know, done, can they actually hit me with an ability. You can still be killed or stunned, it doesn't affect that. And like I said, it, don't, it still only lasts for, you know, seconds, but if your enemy uses a smoke bomb and thinks he's like, all nice and safe, use the shield, run right in there and take him out, you know, I don't know, like, fireman style or something. It's, it's really, really cool. And by the same token, you use, like, an ability against an enemy, he might just use the, the shield and thus, yeah. So, that really changes things up, because now it's not necessarily about getting away from the enemy before he is done, you know, focus aiming, or before he throws that knife. So, yeah. That actually does remind me something I really should say as well, is that you can now have two abilities and one ranged weapon in multiplayer. And ranged weapons are literally knife, the... what's it called? The, the hidden gun, I think the, the poison dart or something, yeah, you can poison from afar now. Not quite sure how I feel about that, but hey, it's there. And the, the ability called Disruption, and Disruption basically makes your vision like black and white and makes these wavy lines go bad, past. It's very effective if, it's, it's super effective if you haven't, if you're, uh, you know, if the target of this ability has not yet locked on or if he isn't quite sure where, you know, his target is. Yeah. And the, you know, so basically what this, you know, this changes so that you can't use both a knife and a gun on someone and basically you'll always have a ranged weapon, you know, a ranged ability of some sort. That, you know, especially if, if you choose knife and disruption, whether you're a pursuer or a target, you can use those. You know, you can use those on a pursuer, you can use them on a target. So there's always that 
ability and yeah again I it at least changes things and again that's really a good thing there's far too little change in this you know, Obama really needs to get involved with the Assassin's Creed franchise is all I'm saying or maybe not considering how little he has changed see I still managed to get actually let me just get one more jab in there among the ways to lower your notoriety are the the print shop where you know I'm, I'm not I don't remember exactly yeah I think it was instead of killing the herald or something you or yeah you can still bribe a herald you can still tear down posters and then there's the print shop you know go to Kinko's pay that guy some and he'll you know print something else starting the you know, possibly the first case, probably, of the American media caring more about, you know, just getting on than actually reporting what's going on. So yeah, I still managed to fit some in there, and I think that pretty much leaves me with only the... the ship. Come to think of it, there's a little bit... Yeah, there, there are a few of the new things that I, I really should talk about. Finishing off the multiplayer is you also have a money bomb and at first I thought it was supposed to like replace firecrackers and it doesn't because firecrackers are still there but basically it does have the effect of the firecracker in, in, in part. It will draw civilians nearby so if the target is like morphed or there's you know there are several lookalikes it'll draw the civilians near and not your target. However you can also use it to you know, get these civilians in to, you know, block the path of the pursuer, slowing him down by having to run into them or run around them. So, that's quite nice. And block the path of your target as well. And, yes, that, that closes off multiplayer quite nicely. Now, this has you dual-wielding melee weaponry. And, basically, you know, the, the not only with the what's it called the hidden blade, which I, the part of me wishes that they had just let Connor use the the tomahawk and the little knife he uses instead of the because it just feels more like him. But anyway, which by the way they're now on like joints so that he can you know you can do a backhanded slash with it that makes a lot more sense. I don't know how you fence with a blade that's just like attached here. It makes sense if you have like a handle on it, but if it's just here, I don't see how it would properly sit there, but if it's on joints, I can see it some better. That that would add to the integrity of the blade, I would, I would imagine. But, but yeah, so you can dual wield any handheld weapon, I believe. And this is basically a, you know, fine and it makes the much easier fighting makes sense and the you know the basic animations for it are fine until you get to the sheathing because there's literally no sheathing animation for the second one. You know, if you sheathe your like if you've got the tomahawk and the blade out and then you press like I think yeah control is by the way the only huge key now. It you know you no longer have the, the E key for that. So and that's basically fine. I'm not sure that much is really lost there. Anyway, if you just, you know, use the... Yeah, if, if you try to sheathe, he'll put away the tomahawk and the other knife will just disappear. And this happens regardless of, you know, anything other than the dual hidden blades is gonna just... the other weapons is gonna disappear and then reappear when you start fighting with it, where, again, he is going to draw his other weapon from the sheath, you know, so, I don't know, it's either, like, a glitch, or they master teleportation of small objects. I like to go with the latter, because it seems more cool that way. But yeah, anyway, it really feels like this was just put in at the last moment, and frankly, it, it's really not the only thing in the game. It, just, it feels like they kept cramming stuff in, and some of the elements also really don't gel all that well. So, yeah. Now, I do believe that leaves me with only the... Yes, the, the ship. I 
will admit, I was not that sold on the, the concept when I heard about it before I played the game. I just didn't really think that it would necessarily be that fantastic, I don't know. And I was sold from, yeah, I, I loved it right from I started trying it. it. It just, it's one of the best aspects of this game and of any Assassin's Creed game thus far. In fact, if there were more things like this in this game, this might actually be better than Brotherhood, but yeah. Basically, it's because they, there's a lot of elements to it, these elements gel, and yeah, I, I suppose that is, is pretty much the explanation. Now, to, to give some more detail, you have the, you, you feel the full weight of the ship. You, you are a captain, you, you steer it, complete with the, you know, thing that he turns. Yeah, not on, on that lingo either. And, you know, you just, you sail around on, you know, varied. Sometimes you're near an island and you might have to be, have to be careful not to hit the island or, like, you know, hit rocks. And you have to, you know, there, there might be local storms that you have to be, you know, be wary of that will affect how you, you know, you're able to sail. And you, you will want to catch the wind, not be sailing against the wind, because that will slow you down tremendously. And there are two speeds, half sail and full sail. And what I noticed, for example, is that the faster you're sailing, the slower the ship will turn around. And, you know, it, it can't just turn around on a dime. I don't know, maybe it's just plain hard to get. But if you want to sail fast, you can't turn that much or turn that fast. And if you want to turn that fast, you can't be sailing fast. And that really makes you make some difficult, quick choices. Because you are fighting other ships. You know, they're ships of that, that type, what's it called? Nah, forget it. And, yeah, they're, they're armed with cannons, you're armed with cannons. And it's just, it's a lot of fun to be shooting at them. And sometimes you can avoid being hit by them, otherwise there is, you, you can brace yourselves. And basically, everything that your people do on, on the ship is based on your order. You know, they, they never say, we can't go to full sail now, or we can't shoot now, if, well, if they're ready to shoot, and if they're uh, able to go to full sail. Yeah. So basically, yeah, you have, you know, so, so when you tell them to brace, they, when you, when you brace, they will brace. And basically it's ducking, and it doesn't seem like this should protect from that much damage, and it, it, it protects from some damage, but again, you'll want to be swift about taking out enemies, and some enemies you'll really want to be careful around. Not, don't get on, don't be next to them, because they can only fire, you know, next to, you know, and, and so can you. And you can, you know, you can upgrade the ship, I never really did, but yeah, it's, it's a possibility at least. And there are at least two different types of enemy ships, and some of the smaller ones you can also destroy with what's called swivel guns, which are very precise, excuse me, and can basically fire anywhere. They can fire front, back, or either side. And but they, they will only work on the smaller ships, or if you've damaged one of the larger ships, you can maybe shoot the like the the what's it called? The gunpowder store storage hold, whatever, and it'll, you know, explode, but, yeah, and you're, one thing I really like, because this one, when you're just running around in single player, you also heal, and it gets both, you know, benefits and, and downsides of that, you know, you're no longer running around with so many healing items that it doesn't matter if you get hit, but, on the other hand, now you just have to avoid being hit for a little while and you will auto-heal, even mid-fight. Like, you can just run a little bit away. Actually, I think it will even happen, even if you continue fighting, as long as you don't get hurt for that, you know, for a little bit. So, yeah. Anyway, the ship does not auto-heal. It does not really heal. And 
unless it reloads last checkpoint, in which case you might be up to the progress you were and you'll just have a fully healed ship. So again, it's not quite perfect, but it's still, it's, it's very tense and you really do feel like you're out there at sea. The bracing is, by the way, also useful for sudden waves because, the, you know, the water will wash over and you have to brace at the exact right time. And the really great thing about the bracing is it takes, it lasts several seconds. So if you do it like too soon or too late, yeah, that's going to cost you. And you can't do it while you're being hit by at least cannon fire. I don't know if you can do it while being hit by a wave, but I can imagine that you can't. And the so so yeah, it's it's just it's all of these elements coming together. There might be sun waves. There might be a sudden a local storm. I think it's called. You know, you have to watch the the direction of the of the main wind. There might be other ships. Maybe some of them you have to protect. Maybe some you know others you have to destroy, and they're trying to destroy you simultaneously. Maybe you have to chase one, and yet you're still occasionally having to brace for waves or the like. And you have to not sail too close to land, even if it might seem beneficial, because it'll damage you and temporarily slow you down. It's just all of these elements, and it really comes together. It it sounds like a lot, but you get into it, you don't feel like it. It feels very organic, very natural. It's kind of the opposite of some of the controls, which used to be intuitive and are now something you have to learn. Yeah, managed to get a dig in there as well. It's it just it feels very natural. And for those that don't care too much for it, it's just like the RTS kind of thing in the, what's it called, in Revelations, the Den Defense, that's what it's called. You don't really have to play it more than you absolutely want to. There are a bunch of missions. You, you can go do naval gazing if you want, but if you don't, there's, there's very few main missions that require you to say, oh, and by the way, you will do boarding as well. So, yeah, if, you know, we're really talking swashbuckle at this point. So, yeah, they, they did fantastic on that. I'm not sure it's really... I, I don't know much about the next one, but it's called, like, Black Flag, and I read that it's, like, a pirate thing. I can imagine they're gonna keep the ship thing, maybe expand upon it in some ways. I can see why. It's, it's really one of the few things in this that are really thoroughly inspired and thoroughly well executed. It's something that you're going to remember afterwards. Unlike the hunting, unlike, well, yeah, the graphics are gonna be outdone. They, they've already been outdone by Hitman Absolution, and the games came out at roughly the same point, so, you know, a few months between them. I actually think Absolution came out a few months before Creed 3, so, yeah. Leaving just one thing for me to say, there is, there's very little extra, you know, tools for just assassination, but you do get the, it's basically scorpion's rope thing, you know, you, you can throw a little distance and pull someone nearer to you or, you know, temporarily stun them to, by just throwing it at them and then let it go. They'll be like, ah, what, what just happened? And you know, pull slightly down. Or if you're, if you've been tree running, you're hanging, you're, you're standing on a branch and you, you know, use it on a soldier underneath, you can hang him, you know, reel him in and hang him from that branch. So that's, that's pretty cool. And yeah, I think that pretty well covers everything. And the ending is a disappointment, but really, at, at this point, we're, we're used to not much really happening, much, not much progression of the story, and I didn't think that they would really be able to end. I mean, it's not the whole... Nah, I shouldn't really give too many details, but the series doesn't end here. I can say without any kind of... but, but yeah. If you just really want to see what happens with 
you know, what it's been building up to over the Assassin's Creed games. Don't get your hopes up. It's, it's a letdown. So, yeah, I do believe that is everything. If you like this review and want a more detailed one, check below. It's there as a video response. If not, it'll be in the description box. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.